All right. So, are there any questions from last time? Yeah, if there are no questions, then today I'm going to make the final presentation. That's going to be the end of my uh, lectures, okay, in this class. And from Monday onwards, the pre other presentations will start. You know, three people have already signed up for Monday, three people for Wednesday. There were two more left over, and you're also going to do Friday. So, you know, I think for, for next week we are covered, okay. And uh, please try, try to make your presentations like maybe between 15 and 17 minutes, okay, so that we can do three of them every lecture, right. So there's 17 people in the class, so we need six lectures, you know, to get through them. And the others also, if you haven't chosen your papers, go ahead and do it right now, you know, because now the clock is ticking. So this is uh, basically a talk that I had presented last year uh, in this IEEE Smart Tech workshop, right, in uh, Waltham, Massachusetts. And <clears throat> the reason I picked this is this was not there in the earlier material, okay, the handouts that I gave you for this course. And I can, I can make these slides available to you when I give you the link for today's lecture, right. Uh, so this will give you a nice overview because, you know, you're presenting this to an IEEE audience. So their background in, in biology is typically zero, okay? So you, there are a lot of things that you will see that you already know, okay? But we'll just go, to, go through them. And then I will, uh, you know, uh, carry you over onto some very recent stuff that we, that, that we are working on, okay? And I will mention those things, you know? So that should make it interesting. Right? But some of the things will be, uh, you know, completely, you know, uh, what should I say? It'll be something that you already know. You picked, hopefully you picked up in this class, okay? If everything looks strange to you, then there's something wrong, right? Then you probably didn't learn anything, right? I, I don't think that, that that was the case, but but let's go ahead, okay? So, you know, you're lecturing to engineers, you know, so you have to give some introduction to molecular biology. Most of them don't even know what the DNA is, right? So I start off by saying that uh, uh, all living organisms are made of cells. This is a typical cell. Cell is the basic unit of life, and each cell is like a massive factory. You have many different compartments inside cells. Actually, these are eukaryotic cells, okay? You know that, right? And, uh, you know, I, uh, you mentioned that, you know, there could be mitochondria. Mitochondrion is the organelle where energy generation takes place. Peroxisome is the organelle where uh, reactions which release hydrogen peroxide are confined. And then there are other organelles here, the chloroplast. If, you, if it's a plant cell, that's the organelle where uh, photosynthesis takes place and so on. And for our purposes, the organelle of interest, because this is based on cancer, right, is basically the nucleus which contains the DNA of the organism. So the nucleus contains genetic instructions written in the language of DNA. And DNA, as we already know, right, we've covered this in detail, has got four bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, AGCT. And it usually occurs in nature as a double-stranded molecule. So you have the red strand here, the purple strand here, and we know the complementary base pairing property. All right? If you have A on one strand at a particular location, in the complementary strand, you're going to have a T. Right? Similarly, if you have a G on one of the strands in the complementary strand, you're going to have a C. And A and T are linked together by two hydrogen bonds, G and C by three hydrogen bonds. Right? So the important thing to note is that because of this complementary base pairing property, if you know the DNA sequence on one of the strands, right? you automatically know the, uh, uh, the DNA sequence on the other one, okay? So if you're looking for a particular DNA strand, you can go fishing for it with its complement as it were, okay? And this is the basis of, the, of this technique that is called microarray technology, which I will talk about a little bit later. We have discussed in detail in this class. Okay. Now the information flow is from DNA, right? So DNA is the abbreviation for deoxyribonucleic acid. Uh, and uh, DNA actually codes for proteins, but the flow of information from DNA to protein is not direct, right? First, the information in DNA is transcribed or copied into another very similar language, right? Which has got the bases A, G, C, and U instead of T, right? And then the, the, the RNA is basically translated into protein, right? Three of those letters code for one amino acid, and proteins are made up of units that are called amino acids that are linked together, right? And this flow of information is so fundamental, right, that all living organisms on this planet express their genetic information in this way, right, starting from the simplest bacterium to humans, and it is referred to as the central dogma of molecular biology. So what are proteins? Proteins are versatile molecules that are responsible for most cellular functions. They're made up of units that are called amino acids. There are 20 amino acids that occur over and over again in nature, right? And a few examples of proteins are hemoglobin. That's the protein that binds oxygen and takes it from the 
lungs to the tissues, right? And uh, it has exactly the right shape for binding oxygen, right? Another example of a protein is insulin, which regulates the level of glucose in your blood, right? It basically controls the number of glucose transporters on the cell. Right. Another example is myosin. That's the protein that generates forces in muscles. That's how you and I move, right, using our muscles. But the take-home message from here is that the, the information that is contained in the DNA, that is the master copy. That's the more permanent, permanent one. And the RNA is the, in, in, the temporary copy that is produced on an as-needed basis. So if a particular protein is needed, needed, the corresponding stretch of DNA is copied into RNA and then translated into protein. So what is a gene? Roughly speaking, a gene is a stretch of DNA which codes for a protein. Now each cell except the reproductive cells from a single organism has got exactly the same DNA. And then the natural question becomes, why do the cells that make up bone look so different from skin cells? Right. That's because not all genes are active or being transcribed at all times. Okay. We have talked about that. Okay. But remember, this, this presentation is for an audience whose background in biology is zero. Right. So this is just oversimplified. Mm -hmm. So by turning genes on and off, we can get a large variety of cells or cell types. Right. And that is the basis of stem cell research. Right. Because it's from the single fertilized egg, you can differentiate and get all different kinds of cells, okay? And the most dramatic example of genes turning on and off at the right location, both in time and space, is the development of an entire individual starting from a single fertilized egg, right? I mean, and that's something really remarkable because to have a human being, you need about 100 trillion cells, okay? You have to have the right number of cells, okay? And that happens most of the time. Now, when it, this is terminology, when a gene is being transcribed, that means the corresponding stretch of DNA is being copied into protein, uh, I'm sorry, being copied into RNA, it is said to be turned on or be expressed. And the base pairing between complementary DNA strands allows us to identify a particular strand if its complement is known, and this is the basis of microarray technology, because on the same slide, you can do that for thousands of genes at the same time. You can measure the activity level of thousands of genes simultaneously. So next we switch gears, move on to cancer. So if you have unicellular organisms like bacteria and yeast, right, they will just multiply if you have, uh, if you give them enough nutrients, right, and the ambient conditions are favorable, right. But in the case of multicellular organisms such as ourselves, the cells have to obey certain social controls. For example, new cells should be produced by cell division only when they are needed, right. And cells are undergoing DNA damage all the time, right? You step out into the sun, some of those T's are messed up, okay? You have what are called thymine dimers. We already talked about them, right? Now, this kind of damage is repaired by repair mechanisms that, we, uh, that our cells possess. However, it's a fact of life that these repair mechanisms slow down with age, right? And therefore, if the repair mechanisms slow down, then you probably can build up some mutations or permanent changes in the DNA over time, right? Now, if you look at the human genome, you have 3 billion nucleotides, right? Only about 2% of that actually codes for proteins. So if you have changes in many places, you have mutations, it's not going to make any difference at the observational level. Right. So there are exceptions, however, and one of them is sickle cell anemia, right, in which there is a mutation in the, in the gene that codes for hemoglobin. Right. And just one single DNA-based mutation is sufficient to make the person get uh, this um, catastrophic disease that is called sickle cell anemia. And the, really the list of uh, genetic diseases or diseases that have a genetic component or, or that can be attributed to mutations in the genes, it's pretty long. Okay? And if you, if you pick up a book on genetics and heredity, they will discuss those at length. But we are focusing on cancer, right? And from the point of view of cancer, we have to note that there are genes in the, in the genome which are responsible for turning on cell division. They are the accelerators on cell division. And, and this is necessary because as I've been saying again and again, all right, the cells on your skin are replaced once every 10 days. The cells lining your gut once every three days. So there is some kind of a dynamic equilibrium, right? The rate at which the new cells are being produced is roughly the rate, same rate at which the old cells are dying, right? So, but you do need situations where the cell division has to be accelerated. For example, if you have a cut or a wound, the platelets at that site, right, they will stimulate the surviving cells, right, to divide faster and heal the wound, right? But what happens if without that stimulus, you know, the cell division is just turned on? And that's one of the ways that cancer can result, right? So what happens when these genes turn on, uh, ju just turn on by themselves as a result of DNA mutation? In the beginning, you're going to have uncontrolled cell division. You get a benign tumor, right? 
excessive cell proliferation. Further mutation will give the tumor the ability to invade surrounding tissue, then it will become a malignant tumor or cancer. Right? And when a malignant tumor finally breaks into the bloodstream of lymphatic system, then it can go, it can travel all over the body. Right? It's like a bad guy that has become mobile, right? and that's the spreading of cancer or metastasis. So it's, it's the metastasis that usually kills people. And this is the flow diagram for the mic uh, microarray, right, flow chart. Right, you have all these infected cells, and uh, two, so two different samples, and you want to study differential gene expression, so you have the complements mob mobilized on this slide. You start from messenger RNA, do reverse transcription, right, get the complementary DNA, label them with different colored dyes, okay, and then get them to hybridize on this slide. Then wash away whatever hasn't hybridized, and then give it excitation uh, at, uh, I mean, using the, uh, the two colors that you have used, for example, here, usually red and green, then look at the two images, and then you try to analyze, you know, is the re red, at a particular location, is the red significantly higher than the green, all right, or significantly lower than the green, or about the same as the green, okay, and we, we covered all of this in detail in this class, all right, all these ratio tests and, and confidence intervals and so on, okay, and then, so each, each location, you will get a number, either one, zero, minus one. Red significantly higher than green, red lower than green, right? Or red about the same as green. And from this information, you can do all kinds of things. You know, you can use, you can run a number of microarrays and then build a classifier, right? So that when you get a new sample, you'd be able to classify it correctly, right? So if I, get, if I, if I train, it, train the classifier with enough normal and cancerous samples, right? When I get a new, new tissue, a new sample, I can look at the microarray image and try to um, uh, you know, classify the new sample. And, and we also talked about all this error estimation and all those things, okay, and the challenges that you get in the small sample environment. So next we move, the information that is there on, the, on, this, uh, on, the, on, on these two slides, okay, and then once you've quantized things, you've got numbers one, zero, minus one. Then after that in this course, we covered expression prediction, right, whereby we looked at some predictors, the expressions of some other genes, all right, are those one, zero, minus one, and can we say something about the gene target that we are interested in? Okay, we looked at COD, coefficient of determination. Then we also discussed how using that information we can construct genetic regulatory networks, all right? Then we talked about probabilistic Boolean networks, all right? So the next thing that we start discussing are Boolean networks and probabilistic Boolean networks. So first we talk about deterministic Boolean networks, which were introduced by Stuart Kaufman uh, way back in the 1960s, and this is his book, 1993 book. So suppose you have n genes, G1 through Gn, you're going to assume that the expression status is binary. So either the gene is expressed, when Xi will be, we'll say that uh, the variable corresponding to gene, the i gene, which is Xi is 1, if the i gene is expressed, Xi is 0, if the i gene is not expressed. And then in the case of a Boolean network, the key defining property is that, the, that each gene will transition, right, according to some Boolean function, of the activity status of all the genes at the previous time point, right? So Xi at time k plus one, right? The, the, uh, the i gene at time k plus one is some Boolean function Fi of the, uh, the activity status of the genes X1 through Xn. And here I'm showing all the genes in, in the argument, but really there will be only like maybe two or three at most, okay? That affect, uh, affect this uh, gene Xi directly, right? So uh, here, Fi is a Boolean function, and as I said, I have to give this talk both to you know biologists and engineers. So for biologists, uh, I have to you know explain what a Boolean function is. So here you have the true table of an AND gate, and then you have the true table of an OR gate. You know, for double E's, that's like A, B, C, D. So I don't have to explain. Then you, so once you have the state of this network, all right, you go ahead and uh, you know write down the the equation. All right, the, the transition equation for this network, where you have now the state vector xk, which is made up of the activity status of all those n genes, and that transitions according to these individual Boolean functions, f1 through fn. And this information about the Boolean functions, you could represent it either in, clo in, in an analytical form, closed form expression, or using a truth table like this, because here this is an example where you have three genes, so binary expression means two to the power of three, eight states, okay? These are the different states. And then these are the predictors for gene number one, two, and three that are telling you, you know, what the value of the gene is going to be at the next time step if you're starting from a particular state, okay? And uh, we also note that this thing here, okay, these three states, zero, one, zero, 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 and one, 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 these form what is called an attractor cycle. If you get in there, you're going to keep on 
cycling, right? And these are conjectured by Kaufman to be indicative of the uh, phenotype, right? Because that's the steady state behavior that's captured over there. So we also covered the alternative representation of a Boolean network. So we uh, start with the state vector, which is, which is basically a binary number. We uh, then obtain its decimal equivalent, right? And then we map this into basis vectors because there will be two to the power of n. Uh, so there are two to the power of n possible gene expression patterns, okay, if you're looking at a size of n, right? Uh, if you're looking at n genes. So we, we look at um, vectors of dimension two to the power of n, basis vectors. And then the evolution takes place according to this kind of equation, right? Wk plus 1 equals Wk times A, where A is a 2 to the power of n by 2 to the power of n matrix, right? And again, all this stuff we covered in, in, the, in this class in detail, okay? We discussed all this thing. So to generalize to PBNs, the main difference is that in the case of a Boolean network, the transition is deterministic, right? If you are at a particular state, you know what the Boolean function is going to be with which you're going to transition. In the case of a probabilistic Boolean network, you're going to transition according to function number one with certain probability, function number two according to certain probability, and so on, okay? And you can show that this kind of transitioning will basically leads to a number of equivalent networks, right? So and at e each time point, you're basically choosing a network, then doing the transition. Reach the next step. Time point, choose a network and do the transition. So this is called an instantaneously random uh, PBN, right? So if you were in network number one, you were in state zero, 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 at the next time step, you would go here. On the other hand, if you happen to be in, in network number two and you were in state zero, 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 you would go to one, one, one over there, okay? So it's a little bit different. And again, just like we did the development, corresponding mathematical development for Boolean networks, for PBNs also, we can do the same thing. But in this case, this WK becomes the probability distribution vector, and A is a stochastic matrix of transition probabilities, right? But this, this is familiar to what, you know, people in the control literature use, right? Control the systems literature use. So this becomes the standard homogeneous Markov chain. And so you can study its, its behavior, its properties using the theory of, of Markov chains, right? So next, we move on to external optimal control in PBNs. In this course, I have done more than that, okay? I talked about, you know, intervening with a single gene, right? Then we talked about altering the steady state distribution, right? And I also discussed this, okay? So this is like a repetition, but, you know, we, we, there's some extra stuff also in this talk, right? So in external optimal control using PBNs, you uh, recognize that the transition probabilities, right, between the different states of a network will depend on external control inputs. So if you're doing cancer therapy, it'll depend on chemotherapy, radiation, and so on, okay? So assume that there are M control inputs, U1 through UM. Each input can take on the value zero or one. So the inputs are also binary. Either you apply the drug or you don't apply the drug, right? You could do more quantization, the analysis would be more involved, right? And we also assume that the values of the control inputs can be changed with time. So since you have M control inputs, you can have a binary vector that will de de define the activity of the control inputs, right? So if this is all zeros, means no control inputs applied. If it's all ones, means all drugs have been applied at the same time, okay? So as before, you can go from this binary vector to the decimal number, right? And this decimal number can take on two to the power of m values corresponding to the different control activity profiles, right? And now you're going to have this uh, transition equation, right? Where wk plus wk is the probability distribution vector, right? So this is going to tell you how the probability distribution vector transitions, right? And the, you have the stochastic matrix of transition probabilities, but now they depend on the control, right? So this becomes a control Markov chain or a Markov decision process, right? And this has been extensively studied in many areas like queuing theory and so on, okay? And you're an industrial engineering person. I'm sure you're familiar with this stuff, right? In operations research, they use it a lot, okay? So the problem now becomes equivalent to the problem of optimal control of Markov chains. And so we are interested in choosing a sequence of control inputs, right, V0, V1, and so on, to minimize a particular cost function, right? And what is the choice of the cost function? So suppose initially we are looking at the, uh, the finite horizon problem, that the treatment horizon is going to be finite, right? So K is going from 0, 1, 2, up to M minus 1, so there are M steps, right? And let C sub K, which is a function of the state and the control at time K, denote the cost of applying control VK at state ZK. And to, to make sure that this problem relates to the real world, you have to take a good amount of input from biologists, okay? It has to make 
biological sense, right? Otherwise, it'll just be a math problem. So then the cost of control over m minus 1 periods, right, will be just the summation of these costs at each time step, right? And again, these are random quantities, so you will have to take an expectation which is conditioned on the initial starting state, right? And note here that even if z0 is deterministic, the initial starting point is deterministic because the, the transitions are probabilistic, the state transitions, so you would have to do, take the expectation to average out the effects. So the net result of the control action is that the state ends up somewhere in, in ZM, right? It ends up somewhere in the state space. And you have, you have to, you, you would ideally want that after you did all this control, you don't want it to end up in a bad state. Okay? You want it to end up in a good state, right? So you would like to penalize this state in the cost to reduce the chances of ending up in undesirable states, right? So you have to assign the, the penalty for the terminal state. So define CM, which is a function of the terminal state, to be the terminal cost of ending up in a particular state, ZM, right? And now you basically have to determine, you have to assign to each of the states, each of the possible terminal states, you have to assign a penalty, right? So to, to uh, assign that, you set all the controls to zero, right? No intervention is being done. You partition the states into equivalence classes because if you have a, an ergodic chain, Markov chain, every state will communicate with every, every other state, okay? But if it's not ergodic, you're going to have some equivalence classes, okay? Such that if you get into one class, you will stay in there, all right? But you cannot jump across classes. So you partition the states into these equivalence classes. You assign higher penalties to states that are associated with rapid cell proliferation or reduced apoptosis, both of which are, you know, hallmarks of cancer, right? And lower penalties for states that are associated with the normal cell cycle. And you would get the input from biologists. And then you would put the two components of the cost together, the terminal penalty, right, and the cost of control. And let's assume that the control input is some function of the state. Okay, it's a state feedback kind of thing, all right, and where this function mu k at every time, time point k is mapping the state space to the control space, right? The two to the power of n dimensional state space to the two to the power of m dimensional control space. So your problem becomes minimize this cost function subject to the state transition equation. The probability that z k plus one equals j condition on z k equal to i nu k is a i j v k, nu k, right? So this is a transition probability matrix. This problem can be solved using dynamic programming and its variance, okay? And it's a very computationally intensive. For those of you that are familiar with that, you know, as the number of genes grows, it's, it's, it's really a nightmare, you know? And there are people who have done approximations and things like that, you know, so. But remember, again, I mean, this is not the best way to do this stuff because we had n genes, okay? By doing all these manipulations, we now have two to the power of n states, okay? So it's not scalable, all right? So you have to find, do something better. And not only that, the connections, the individual connections, those are very sparse, okay? As I've been saying that each node is affected by at most two or three inputs, okay? So you don't really need the whole uh, matrix, you know, it's going to be a sparse matrix, all right? And it's, it would be much better to try and exploit the structure of the matrix. And I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of this lecture, all right? So uh, we, we uh, use this method on the Win5A network, all right, which was obtained from data collected in the context of metastatic melanoma. Win5A is a gene which has been implicated in metastatic melanoma. If Win5A expression is high, the melanoma has a high chance of metastasizing. Right. If it is low, the prognosis is good. Right. So here, uh, this was a subset of experiments with 31 cell lines all right, measuring gene expressions using microarrays and 587 genes. And uh, they came up with, uh, some folks at the NIH, they came up with a closely knit 10 gene network, which we further reduced to seven, okay, because of the curse of dimensionality that is associated with dynamic programming. And this one used ternary data, like upregulated, downregulated, right, unregulated, okay. And so you use the COD and then you came, come up with a network like this, okay, with these seven genes in there. And we want to keep the Winti5A gene expression low, right. And again, I'm skipping the details because I went through those details in, in, in the class last time, okay? All the different methods, okay, finite horizon, infinite horizon, then look at, you know, context sensitive and so on, okay? But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we wanted to you do the infinite horizon one because that gives you the stationary policy that does not change with time. The control policy does not change with time. It just depends on the state. And here we had a situation where Winti5A was made the most significant bit. 
So therefore, uh, and there were seven genes here, all right? We made them binary. How? By grouping together the minus ones and zeros, all right? And uh, we, so we made this binary. So if you have seven genes, you have 128 possible states. And this is the initial distribution of the probability mass in, in these states, okay? I'm sorry, this is not the initial, this is the distribution, the steady state distribution of the probability mass in the absence of any control. You can see that the probability mass is more heavily concentrated in states from 63 onwards. That means in the bad states. If you use stationary control, right, uh, the stationary policy, you can see that the probability mass has been shifted to the good states. Okay. So you have been able to achieve something at least by doing control. Right. And, and if the steady state behavior is indicative of the pheno phenotype, then this kind of thing should should help you. Okay, now I want to switch gears and talk about something that we have not really covered, okay? Now, like, uh, once we had worked all this out, you know, like this was about six, about seven years ago, right? So we had like a million dollars from the Keck Foundation to do experiments, okay, on, on this, okay? So I still remember uh, then in 2008 or 2009, I went to Phoenix and I told Mike Wittner, you know, that please run these experiments, okay? and give me the data and we are going to build networks and all that and, and use that kind of theory. So, you know, what he told me, he told me, well, uh, you know, you're trying to design sophisticated sprinkler control systems, okay? But let me tell you two things, okay? Number one, biology hasn't had its Newton as yet, okay? And we are still trying to figure out the basic plumbing, okay? And the basic, so, I mean, all those theories are good, okay? But what, I mean, there's a big disconnect here, okay? So, it is, and he gave me a diagram that I will get to shortly, all right, that's a, basically a pathway signaling diagram, all right, and I'll show you the problem that he was interested in. So, now, it is a fact that as engineers, we are used to mul analyzing multivariate behavior and all that, okay, so we are saying, oh, these guys are using marginal information, you know, it's no good, you know, because, and we know how, you know, if you base decisions only on marginal information, you, you could be way off, all right, because, for example, if you have an AND gate, all right, Nothing happens until all the inputs become one, okay? So even if one input is missing, you're not going to get, get the full behavior, right? But anyway, the, the thing is that in the biological literature, there is a prevalence of a lot of prior knowledge in the form of signaling pathways, right? This is marginal information. It, it's even inaccurate to some extent, right? But it's good to take that into account, right? Like you listen to your parents, right? They, have, they might be having some marginal information. They, they're not enrolled in the PhD program here, at least for most of them. But they know something, right? I mean, they've seen see in the real world. So I think what needs to be done is take that information along with whatever you learn and then, you know, you can probably do better. Okay. So, but that information definitely should be incorporated because that will reduce the dimensionality of a search space because you have this 2 to the power of two, uh, n by 2 to the power of n, okay? Inferring that from data, okay, you're never going to get that kind of data, right? So you'd like to, inf you'd like to basically incorporate the prior information, right? And to keep things simple, we basically went ahead with binary quantization of gene protein activity. Again, it's either there or it's not there, okay? And based on this, I mean, there is a paper, I think somebody in this class is going to present that, okay? So I had a student, right, who actually went ahead and used, uh, you know, methods of logic design, right, where you use Carnot maps and all that, right, to, to come up with networks that are consistent with path pathway information, right? Consistent with the marginal behavior, right? So if somebody tells you this gene is high, that one is low, other one is high, so you put those as constraints, okay? And subject to those, you can come up with, with, with networks, right? Which will have, where it will require a lot less data, right? Because the number of, uh, the connectivity would have been considerably reduced, okay? Now, uh, for what I'm about to present right now, we did not have to come up with that network because the signaling diagram was given to us by the biologist, okay? So this is what, this is the diagram that Mike Bittner gave me, right, in 2009, okay? So when I, when I wanted to do, him to collect data to do all those experiments, he told me that what would be a lot more useful, okay, is if you could do something about this diagram. Because this one, we, he, we, he's, we are not trying to infer anything based on gene expression. Based on his prior knowledge, right, as a biologist, he believes that this is a signaling diagram. And let me just explain, okay, you will understand what this is. So this is what is called the, the growth factor signaling pathway, right, or the mitogen activated protein kinase signaling pathway, right. See, remember, if I go back one more slide, okay? See, a cell is supposed to divide only when more cells are needed, okay? How is it going to get that information? The other cells, like in the case of the platelet-derived growth factor, the platelets will come, the platelets are the growth factor ligands, okay? They will come and bind this transmembrane 
receptor pro protein. Okay, that's a growth factor, all right? It's a receptor tyrosine kinase. Remember, we talked about one of the amino acids being tyrosine. That's crossing the, the, the membrane as a double helix, all right? So when the growth factor comes and binds here, that causes a downstream signaling, or a signaling cascade. And now you know what those are, okay? The cyclin-dependent kinases and things like that, all right? All that signaling will take place, and the net result will be at the bottom of the totem pole, the cell, there'll be signals that'll turn on uh, asking the cell to divide, okay? So that's what that diagram, uh, the next diagram is. That's the signaling diagram. So these guys are growth factors, all right? This is the epidermal growth factor, okay? That's the growth factor that makes your skin cells multiply. I said every 10 days they're being replaced. It needs some growth factor too, right? So epidermal growth factor. Then there is this uh, insulin growth factor, IGF, right? Then new regulin is another growth factor, right? So then this is hep heparin binding epidermal like growth factor, right? So these guys are the growth factors. So these are external to the cell. They'll come and bind the membrane. And these are the growth factor receptors that are implanted in the cell membrane, like in the, I showed in the fig previous figure. So this is the growth factor receptor for EGF, right? Then there will be growth factor re receptor for IGF, or right? insulin-like insulin -like growth factor and so on, okay? So when these guys come, these growth factors come and bind the growth factor receptors, then there is downstream signaling, all right? There's this molecule GRB2 that will bind something. And then at the bottom, there is this RAS, okay? RAS is, an, is a proto-oncogene, all right? Because RAS can get hyperactive because if it is bound by GTP, all right? Guanosine triphosphate, all right? It's like a supercharged hyperactive uh, molecule, right? And GTP, uh, RAS also has GTPase activity because of which the third phosphate will be removed and then it will become inactive. But if due to some mutation that doesn't happen, right, you are going to have RAS that is permanently charged up, okay? And that can cause all these downstream signaling, right? And these are the proliferation pathways. There's a RAS, RAF, MEK1, ERK2, and then it's going to result in the transcription of genes that are resp responsible for ma making the cell multiply much faster, right? So that's one set of, of genes. Then, in addition, there are genes over here that that actually induce apoptosis. Okay, like this one, BAD is B, B, BCL2 assisted death promoter. Okay, and this and here again the re relationships with the black arrows. These are basically enhancing relationships. All right, the ones that ter are terminating in the in the blunt uh, bars. Okay, in red. Those are inhibitory relationships, all right? Now, these guys are drugs. Lepartinib is a drug, right? It's an inhibitor. It's going to go and block the activity of this one, all right? This epidermal growth factor receptor. And they intervene at different points, and he knows that based on his prior knowledge. So the problem that he posed to me was that given this diagram, okay, if I measure some activity at downstream, at the, of some of these downstream genes, okay, and tell you what this information is, can you tell me which set of drugs I should use? Okay, because in cancer, what is going to happen if it is normal behavior, if there are no growth factors, okay, growth factors are off, right? And uh, there is also one of the one of the signals here is a there's a P10, right? Let me show you P10 here because my uh, pointer is out of battery. This P10, this is a tumor suppressor, okay? So tumor suppressor, as you know, is a break on cell division, okay? Whereas uh, these these guys, these are accelerators on cell division, all right? So now, if you don't have any growth factors, all right, growth factors are missing, all right? And let's say the tumor suppressor is on, okay? Then the cell should not proliferate. It's just like in a car, okay? If you took your foot off the gas, all right, and both the brakes are on, okay? Or at least one of the brakes is on, all right? The handbrake, or your car shouldn't move, all right? But in cancer, that's not going to hold because none of the growth factors are there. The brake on cell division is intact and yet the cell is proliferating. Why? Because somewhere inside, something has been messed up, okay? So what do you do, right? You don't have the luxury of going and tearing up everything and seeing where it got messed up. It's going to take too long. You want to use a system theoretic approach, right? Look at the input and the output, right? And can you uh, get some idea about where the problem has occurred, right? And come up with the best combination of drugs, okay? So we were able to do that for this particular signaling diagram because the one he gave us this does not include any feedbacks okay so we were able to represent this using a, a boolean logic circuit right a digital circuit actually right see like this di digital circuit here all right we were able to represent it like this all right and this was the idea of a student of mine who's right now an assistant professor at iit Kharagpur in india you know see he, he was working so uh, you represent it by a digital circuit where you have and gates and now what you're essentially trying to do is trying to find out what are the, all the different fault combinations that can take place, okay? 
how many faults are there? Okay, because if a gene gets stuck at one, if it's a, an oncogene, right, then that will cause cancer, right? If it's a tumor suppressor gene that gets stuck at zero, so he, in this one, it's not that difficult. You can figure out that there are you know, 24 different faults and they're indicated on the next diagram I'll show you in a moment. But the, the input that you're going to be interested in, the combination of inputs is all growth factors zero, right? That's why the one highlighted in green you can see all growth factors are zero, and then the last one is P10, which is the tumor suppressor, which you want to be active, all right? So under that situation, all right, if everything was normal, I would get all zeros at the bottom, okay? Because these are indicators of e either proliferation, all right, or suppression of apoptosis, all right? And if that's not happening, all right, can I look at that signature and then say, okay, somewhere the thing has gone wrong, and this is the combination of drugs to use. So he went ahead and worked that out. So this is the, these are all the faults, numbered 1 through 24. Uh, I think the black numbers indicate stuck at 1 faults that will lead to cancer, red numbers stuck at 0 faults. And uh, a stuck at 1 fault means if this point is stuck at 1, it doesn't matter what the uh, signaling logic is, the output is going to be 1, all right? So he did that, and then the effect of the drugs, okay, before I get to the effect of the drugs, so Based on this output signature, right, you can group these faults into equivalent classes, all right? See, like if the fault location is at uh, 1, then, then you get all these 1, 1, 1, 1. All, all these things will be high. Similarly, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, those different locations, you will get all those uh, components of the output vector will be high, okay? So those faults are equivalent. It doesn't matter where it occurred. As far as what you can see from the input-output behavior, all those faults are equivalent, right? So you, you could, he could do some kind of fault classification, right? And also, therapeutic in intervention also you can model within the Boolean framework. How? Because the, the drugs that are being used in this diagram are all kinase inhibitors. Okay, remember, you need kinases when you're going to have cell proliferation. So these, all of them, they basically go and block the activity of the kinase. So he modeled it using an inverted input to a, an AND gate, right? And I have to come here and show you, right? Because if, if, if this drug is there, right? If there is one here, it will be a zero. Input to the AND gate is, is zero, so the output is zero, regardless of what is coming down from there. So you have basically cut off the downstream signaling, okay? So that's how he modeled this. And so now, when the system is under faults, we are going to apply these different drugs, okay? Drug combinations, and there were six di drugs in that diagram, right? And these are the drugs, all right? These are the six drugs, lapartinib and, and so on, okay? And, uh, uh, these are the seven outputs that we are monitoring, right? And under the fault scenario, under each of these faults, you can go and compute, right? You can go and basically see, you know, uh, you can you try to evaluate the effectiveness of the different drug combinations. So on the left here, right, this first uh, column in white on the left, these are all the different drug combinations, okay? One means a particular drug is applied, zero means the drug is not applied. There are six of them, right, over here. On the horizontal direction, you can see 1 through 24, those are the different faults, okay? And there is color coding here. There's some math that has gone into it, you know, not very high-level math, but, you know, color coding where you're saying, okay, uh, the green is good, all right? Red is bad, okay? Green means that, that, that the cell is not going to proliferate, okay? Because, remember, we are looking at the scenario where there are no growth factors, the break is intact, okay? Cell should not proliferate, okay? So we really want green. So if you look, look across, you know, for the different combinations of drugs, if it's red, means it's very bad, okay? It's really proliferating. And there are some numbers here, like 9.5 and all that, you know. See, here he's done the, the mapping here, all right? So, for example, if you look at the combination, all right, uh, I think the fourth and the fifth one is 1-1, one, one, all right? That's a good combination, all right? Uh, see, like, if you look at the middle, the first green that you see, all right? Let's see, the... Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6... Seventh row, seventh row, yeah. In the seventh row, it's pretty good, actually. The, co the combination of drug number four and five gives you pretty good response across all the, all the possible mutations, okay? And here, he's considering only one mutation at a time, okay? Not in cancer, you probably will have multiple mutations. Okay? So, so that's a good combination. So, so from here, and at the same time, if you add one more drug to it, so I, I think if you look at the next, next row, okay? You added one more drug, but you didn't get anything. So you, you probably, I mean, you didn't get anything more. So you probably will not, uh, you know, use those three drugs, okay? You'll just use two of them because you don't want an extra drug with more side effects, okay? So using some kind of, you know, arguments like this, you know, you, you'd like to come up 
with the best combination, right? And compare it with some other combination, right? And then do actual experiments to see whether that holds or not, okay? And the actual experiments kind of got delayed because, you know, Dr. Bittner was in TJ and I was here and, you know, he had other things. But now he's here. So we are going to do some of these experiments uh, here itself, okay? Now, a couple of... Yeah, a couple of other things. See, the, another thing that I'm interested in is that this diagram, okay? Remember, he supplied us with that pathway information. That is not accurate, right? So, you know, if that pathway information is messed up, we can make predictions from here. They will probably not match up, okay? So the thing to do is to use prior information from the literature, right? Along with observational data that you can generate from experiments, combine them to get better models, right? And, and, and then come up with a table like this, okay? Hopefully your chances, and you can use a Bayesian framework, right? It's a prior plus observation. It's going to give you the next prior, all this business about all the conjugate priors and all that. So those are things that we are going to look at, okay? In fact, we are looking at some of those things right now, okay? Uh, another thing, so yeah, let me just finish this and then I'll talk about the other thing. So the conclusion to this talk is that using prior knowledge of pathways and drug targets, we developed a systematic lookup table to predict the best possible drug vector which can counteract the effect of a single stuck at fault. The stuck at fault position identification also can be carried out using a proper test input vector. So again, the emphasis here is not going going and dissecting the whole thing. It's like input output behavior. It's like, you know, engineering approach. Input output behavior, try to nail down the fault. It's just like if there's a fault in the power system, you know, you don't go and digging all over the place. You know, you look at certain key points and then try to figure that out. So the future research directions include multi-fault analysis. So I have somebody that has done some work on that. Accommodation of more pathways and drugs and possibly some real wet lab experiments to validate the modeling and verify the predictions, right? So, and, and those are being do actually done right now, right? Now two, actually a couple of other interesting directions that we are working in. Uh, one of them is, uh, involves the connections between cancer and diabetes, right? Uh, you know, like um, normal cells, okay? If they don't have, uh, see, if you have enough oxygen in the environment, normal cells will not uh, you, uh, use the glycolysis and the TCA cy uh, cycle, okay? So, uh, I'm sorry, they will not just use, remember, when you're trying to get energy from glucose, right, uh, there is a two-step process. First, you break down the six carbon sugar into three carbon, uh, two, three carbon sugars, all right? That's called glycolysis, all right? That's not a very efficient process, but it doesn't require oxygen, all right? After that, this goes to several other steps, which I didn't cover in detail in this class, all right? And finally, you get carbon dioxide and water, okay? So the cells usually, if, if they are in an oxygen abundant environment, they will run the process all the way up to the production of carbon dioxide and water, okay? Cancer cells, on the other hand, even if you have lots of oxygen, they will just run glycolysis, okay? And one of the reasons for that is that, you know, the raw materials that result from glycolysis, they are needed for making more cells, okay? Because the objective of the cancer cell is not just to produce energy, okay? It needs energy, right? And in fact, because it's running a less efficient procedure, cancer cells typically have, uh, you know, a high level of glucose in them, right? And that's the basis of this uh, P, you may have heard of PET scans, positron, uh, positron emission tomography scans for, as a detecting uh, cancer because, because it's using a less efficient process, so it needs lots of glucose, okay? So it's going to import more and more glucose, okay? So that's a characteristic. So one thing that we are trying to see, right? Because there have been epidemiological studies that have shown that, uh, you know, treating uh, diabetics with, uh, with a particular drug called metformin, right, reduces the chances of getting cancer. So we're trying to see if, if the combination of some chemotherapeutic drugs and, and metformin, okay, is going to be a better treatment or not, you know, using network modeling, the kind that I showed you, right, and then make predictions about which combination is going to be good, okay, because metformin is not toxic. Most of the chemotherapeutic drugs are toxic. Okay? So that's one thing that we are looking at. Another thing, I have a student that is looking at the heterogeneity problem, because in cancer, if you have the if you have just one fault, then it's okay. You can go and find out, but usually it'll be all mixed up, okay? Because cancer tissue is usually heterogeneous. Like some of the cells may have a breakdown somewhere, some other cells have breakdown somewhere else. So if you pick up a drug, you treat it, all right? And let's say you targeted one population, you got rid of that. Let's say the other one takes over, all right? So it would be nice to have a method where you could look at some gene expression data or some other you know observational variable 
and make an educated guess about what the breakdown in the population is and use that. It's similar to identification and control that we use in system theory all the time. You know? So that student of mine has used some Bayesian approach, hierarchical Bayesian modeling to come up with a technique and we are right now in the process of uh, doing experiments, you know, mixing up cell lines and trying to see whether we can predict that or not. You know? So these are some of the things that uh, are going on here. Okay. And for many of you students here okay, that are AgriLife supported, it's the same kind of thing. Okay, here, my goal is basically to slow down the progression of cancer, okay, or to prevent metastases, okay, using the signaling. That in the case of these AgriLife applications, it's the genome of the plant. Okay, there are signaling pathways over there, right? And probably at least most of uh, the AgriLife students that are supported here, uh, they are going to work on water use projects, right? Where basically you're trying to enhance the efficiency of the plant in terms of using water so that it can survive drought a lot better. Okay. So you would be interested in looking at genes which uh, are associated with uh, drought resistance, right? and then see how you can alter the activity of that gene. Okay. So that's what your projects are going to be about next semester. You know. There are people, there, and there are biologists involved. They're working on those, they're generating the data. I think sometime next semester you will get the data. Okay. And uh, so I think you've come a long way, I, or at least I hope. Okay. Based on the exams, it looks like you've come a long way. Uh, like you knew nothing about biology, most of you, okay, but now at least you attended, I think many of you attended uh, Nushin's uh, presentation last week also, right? I mean, you now know what next generation sequencing is, right? You're just going to do parallel operations and all that stuff. So that's where we stand, basically. So are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah, 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 no, 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 the goal is, see, curing cancer is, is, a, is a long shot, okay, like, I think it was President Nixon that declared the war on cancer or something, you know, but those were the early days, okay, but now I think the general thinking is that if you can make cancer like a manageable disease, okay, that doesn't kill you, right, like, like diabetes, if, if somebody gets diabetes, okay, that cannot be cured, okay, so they just keep the blood sugar under control, so if, if somebody has cancer, you take your medications, okay, and you just keep it in control, okay, so that it doesn't metastasize and kill you, okay. And, you know, some of the cancers are slowly progressing, like if it's a prostate cancer or something like that, you know, it's, I mean, uh, sometimes there's no point in treating it because the person will most probably die of other causes, okay. So the goal is to make, yeah, if you cannot cure it, at least make it a more manageable disease, yeah. That's the goal. But I, I wonder why people don't look at the way, like, they're trying to fix the gene itself, maybe like, for example, one gene is mutated and it causes the... Yeah, but you, you, you... you but you have to do it for each and every cell in the body, okay? You'll have to do it for each and every cell in the body. And there are difficulties associated with it, you know. Because again, it's a multivariate thing. You try to fix one thing, something else gets messed up, you know. And the experiments are going pretty well because what I talk about cancer diabetes, Mike Bittner sent me an email this morning that he, right now he's running those experiments. You know, by next week he'll have some data. We'll see where it goes, you know, but because we had to redesign some of those experiments, but yeah. So, yeah, hopefully, you know, now with him having relocated his lab here, right, uh, I think things will move a lot faster. And, and he, you know, four years, and these things change with time, like four or five years ago, he was big on the proliferation thing. He was the one that gave me this diagram and all that. But right now, he thinks that, you know, in proliferation, the problem is that you have so many different possibilities about things going uh, wrong, okay? And then you block something, something else takes over because it's a multivariate thing. So his thinking is that if you can induce the cancer cell to die, okay, if you can induce cell death, okay, in a decisive way, okay, then the success rate will be much higher, okay. That's the latest thing that we are actually looking at, yeah. We're looking at, and, you know, we've put in some proposals and all that, but, you know, and he has some ideas about which drugs to, uh, to use, because in order for a cell to stay alive, okay, there's a mitochondria generates energy, right, there's oxidative phosphorylation, that mitochondrial respiration has to take place, right? Few days ago, you might have heard about somebody that uh, committed suicide by ingesting, uh, I think, uh, was it sodium cyanide or something? Or maybe you guys don't ke keep track of, it happened here at A&M, okay? So if you, huh? Sodium cyanide? See, if, uh, you, you won't survive if you, ha if you take sodium cyanide because if you uh, take sodium cyanide, it'll go to your stomach or it'll react with the hydrochloric acid right, and it'll re release hydrogen cyanide, okay. Now, hydrogen cyanide is toxic for your mitochondria. As soon as the, that reaches your cells, you're dead, okay, because, I mean, even in India, you hear sometimes people committed suicide by ingesting rat poison, okay. But the problem is, if you do those things, you know, it's like a, 
a decisive step, okay, you are going to die, okay, because if your mitochondria stop functioning, then you're finished, okay. So here also, you know, he's trying with some molecules to target that, you know. But the, the cancer diabetes thing, if we can do that, that'll be good because, you know, it is the, only the cancer cells that have got a voracious appetite for glucose, okay, that are running this uh, glycolysis even when you have oxygen. So it's like a differential targeting. See, because normally you can go and use chemotherapy and kill cells, but in the process or radiation, you kill the normal cells also, okay. You can cure the cancer, but you can kill the patient. You know, that's not very difficult to do. All right. So, uh, but if you want to, you know, cause minimum collateral damage, you know, then you have to think about uh, other approaches, you know. Okay. So you can store the cancer from sugar. This was low. Uh... Yeah, because, because the cancer cell is the one that needs a lot of sugar. Okay, ne needs a lot of sugar and the only other cell time that it happens, that happens in the womb, okay, because those cells are dividing very fast, okay. But in adult cells, normally they don't need that much of sugar, okay, and they will usually run this TCA cycle. They will run the more efficient process, all right. In fact, the guy who discovered that, that cancer cells use glycolysis even when you have a lot of oxygen, all right, in the environment, uh, his name is Otto Warburg, all right, and he discovered that, I think, in 1924. He got a Nobel Prize for that, okay, in... in uh, medicine or biology or whatever. And the other one that when you have enough oxygen in the environment, the cells are going to r run the, you know, the complete process, that's called the Pasteur effect, okay? Named after Louis Pasteur, right, from long time ago. Yeah. And, you know, for those of you that are working here, you know, you can uh, collaborate with your AgriLife, uh, you know, collaborator and try to learn more about the biology. Because the, the theory for doing all this stuff is there, okay? I mean, there are a lot, lots and lots of smart people in the systems areas that have worked out all different kinds of models, okay? The challenge is to get them to fit to the actual biology. So if you spend the time, right, and if you're working, let's say, on cancer, you could talk to Mike Wittner, somebody in the vet school, and, and identify an important problem, okay? Like, you don't want to, I mean, you can do that, okay? You don't want to solve some epsilon problem, okay? Epsilon math problem. Because if you wanted to do that, what's the point in taking this course and learning all this biology and spending time and taking those exams and all that? You, know, you could just uh, work with Viterbi's algorithm or something you know, and, and just do the theory, and, and that's fine, okay? But here, if you're going to make an impact, it has to be some... You may not succeed in solving the problem, okay? You may take baby steps towards it, but if you do succeed, okay, the splash is huge, okay? All right? The difference is big, all right? So if it's like a paper in transactions or something like that, you know, you, you, you can check out the impact factors, right? In transactions versus like nature or science or something like that, you know, you can, the numbers will speak for themselves, you know. But of course, this requires interdisciplinary skills because you cannot just, uh, you know, fool around and say, okay, I know all the math, you know, let me just find one bio problem I put in. That's not going to have much impact anyway. You know. But for example, even the plant thing, if you guys can figure out, let's say a gene or something like that, all right, or find a way of putting some gene into a plant that is going to make it use a lot less water, okay? In Texas, there are lots of funding opportunities and, you know, uh, big things could happen, right? And the same thing is true with cancer. And all these problems, the underlying systems part is the same. The systems biology thing is the same, okay? It's no different. In, in the case of next generation sequencing, what are they doing, okay? Instead of using gene expression, right, you are going to sequence the RNA, right? This, that's what they call RNA-seq, and basically here the quantitation was done based on the intensity of light. Over there, the quantitation will be done based on how many times you count it, okay? So the same stuff you can take and, you know, whatever work has been done here, provided, of course, you think it is going to have high impact, right? I mean, there are two things here. You want your degree also, right? You don't want to be stuck here for 20 years, you know, doing real high-impact stuff, you know, and then the highest impact is that you don't have a degree, all right? <laughs> you don't want that, right? But you have to do a balance between it. Like, I can do it, okay, because I don't need a degree, right? I already have the degree, so. But I'm, I understand your situation, but try to focus on important problems, sorry. Not on epsilon contributions here and there. And the area is good simply because there are very few people that have expertise both in biology and in the quantitative sciences, okay? Because it's tough, okay? I mean, come on, I mean, double E is a tough major, okay? I mean, we're having trouble getting... Students in here, I shouldn't be saying that, you know, I should be saying it's easy. <laughs> that was the wrong, no, I'm just saying that, yeah. so, uh, you know, like, and having overcome that hurdle to go out of their comfort zone, learn the biology, and put the, you know, it's like the learning never ends, okay, so.
Okay, so from on Monday, whoever was going to present, you know, we, we get started with the presentations on Monday, right? Three on Monday, three on Wednesday, three on Friday, three following Monday, and then three the Monday, in, first Monday in December, and maybe another two in, uh, uh, on Wednesday the third, you know. We'll finish it. Let, let's see how it goes, you know, but try your best and make a good presentation. Make a clear presentation. Don't come and give, you know, hundreds of equations and all that, you know. Try, try to give the big picture. Right, I mean, you probably won't because it's not your own work, but in a lot of the student uh, d defenses and all that, I mean, even today I was attending a prelim, okay, the guy is proving all the theorems and all that, you know, we don't want to listen to, all, I mean, we don't mind, you know, it's for the reviewers, but you know, give the big picture, you know, okay, don't try to hide behind the mathematics. Okay. All right, thanks.